Hi everybody, John Jagerson here. Let's jump in, take a look at the markets. Now, uh, this week by far, the most questions that I've gotten have been about the inflation report, which is due tomorrow. This is the Consumer Price Index CPI. What kind of an effect is that going to have on the market? This is a very interesting question. So th let's actually start, it's a longer answer, but I, I think it's a positive one. Uh, but let's start out by just looking at where we are on the S&P 500. So currently, we've enjoyed quite a run in the market. We've got, come up off of support, which we kind of figured was fairly likely right there at about 3,900. Uh, the bounce has been a lot more robust than I certainly would have expected. But we've had a very positive week, and that's continued this week. So what are investors pricing in? There's some different theories. Are they expecting that inflation is going to come out on Tuesday lower than expected, maybe, which their expectations are already relatively low? Or uh, maybe growth has been underestimated? And I think the answer to both of those questions is probably too early to tell and maybe not major changes in inflation. The other potential answer is, is this a short squeeze? So in other words, have companies that have been very heavily shorted are they uh, right now? Are buyers jumping in to cover their or short sellers? Are they buy, are they jumping in right now to cover their shorts, and therefore we have this uh, the move to the upside? This oftentimes happens on individual stocks, stocks that are a little hairy, and a lot of investors will all pile in short, and then they'll have a positive earnings report or something like that. The price of the stock spikes, and the, as it spikes, short sellers have to cover, so they buy the stock in order to cover. Now you get a bit of a feedback loop. Do we get that market wide? Well, there is, there's really not any evidence right now that that's the case. I, I know some analysts are arguing that that is the, the issue right now. But, but actually, if you look at one way that we might be able to detect it is if we were to look at the most shorted stocks out there. So even a lot of the, the big meme stocks, like, um, like let's say, I don't know, Bed Bath & Beyond or something. So we'll pull up that one. That's on my mind. Or GameStop or uh, Logitech. I mean, so some companies that are actually really good, Logitech, for example, but have been heavily shorted as investors are expecting peripheral sales to be low. Uh, they, are these stocks... Are they seeing really outsized gains? Well, some of them are, but on average, if you look, for example, at the on the S&P 500 at the top 50 uh, stocks that are, or the top 50 shorted stocks on the S&P 500, we the performance is a little bit better than normal, but not not so much better than the S&P 500 that we would say, okay, this is definitely a short squeeze, because if it were, that's where we would expect it to show up. So what's going on? This looks like investors are adjusting their expectations a little. So they, they now, I say that, but not in terms of the Fed actually changing their mind. So for example, if we look at the, the Fed's countdown, so here I've got the, the histogram chart that we like to use. This is from the Chicago Merck. And it basically looks at expectations. And here I have it set to December. Expectations for is the Fed going to raise rates by 75 basis points this week? Expectations are overwhelmingly yes. So I think it's safe to assume that that has been priced into the market. Everybody's expecting it, so that's what we were going to get. This is expectations for, well, will the Fed raise the overnight rate by another 75 basis points by the end of December? So by December's meeting. So if they were to do so, if they were to do 75 basis points this time, th this week, which they will, uh, it's almost certain that they will. Then that brings the lower boundary up to three percent. So are they going to do another 75 basis point hike by the end of the year? That, so that would bring us up to if that brings us to three, then 3.75, which is right about there. And we're expecting. So if we do some round numbers here, 69 percent or investors rather are putting a 69 percent probability. But then if you add the probability that investors think they might even go another quarter point, so a full point hike, uh, then it's almost, again, we're almost getting to a certainty. It's like 94% uh, odds that the market is pricing in that the Fed is going to do the rate hike this week and then another one before the end of the year of 75 basis points, so equal to this week's or even greater one percentage point. So we'd have to assume at this, at this level that uh, it looks like investors have priced that in. So what we would conclude from that is that, well, if investors have already priced in what they think the Fed is going to do, then what, what's driving the market rally here? And it does look like it's adjust, adjusted views for what to expect for the fourth quarter. Now, it's probably a little bit early for that just yet. 
We don't have enough earnings data yet to get a good read on that. We've had a few teaser reports. Uh, Kroger, for example, that was an interesting one. So Kroger came out last week. Uh, you can see the report or the reaction to the report on Friday. So you can see that uh, you can see that here. So this is the Kroger's. So and this is an important one. It's not just a it's an early reporter, so it kind of overlaps a little bit in between the two quarters. Uh, and what they did say is that demand from shoppers is higher than expected. So they beat expectations and their outlook improved for the fourth quarter. Now, one report does not constitute a trend, but that is fairly promising. I wouldn't throw them in the same category of an economic bellwether as, let's say, a, a Walmart or a Target, but this is a Good sign. If we were to get more of these, that would be very positive. In fact, even even today, let's look at one more. Even today, after the market closed, Oracle. So let's see, O R C L. Now they did report that um, although that they they missed expectations in some respects. Revenues were good. The stock is up in the post market a little bit. They did sustain some damage from a rising dollar. Now that, that, that is a, usually a problem for tech companies like Oracle, but their other data was so good, it, it compensated for that basically. So we are seeing, I would say, I would chalk both of these up into their early signs for sure, but they are relatively positive that if tech continues to look like Oracle and if consumer defensive and retail continues to look like Kroger, then yeah, investors might have overpriced the negatives in the market in the fourth quarter. And if you think about that, I, I think right now it's still kind of a stretch to assume to get really adjusted, but it's not such a stretch that we would say, okay, uh, I don't, I, or rather I don't think that it's a stretch to say, well, based on the data that we've got, I think we can still be very confident that support, at a minimum, that support is intact. So going back to the S&P 500, that means that we'd be we would remain confident that the uh, that support, which right now is down around. So once again, let's take a look at it real quick. So we got support right now down around uh, 3,900. That buying on the dips still makes sense, which was basically what we were saying last week that we should get some dip buying opportunities. Uh, do I think there's a new bull trend? I don't yet, or there's just not enough evidence. But the, the meager evidence that we are getting does seem to indicate that investors are not overly concerned about inflation or the Fed's fight with inflation, at least right, right now. It, it's so much so anyway, that they are uh, really heavily discounting the market. Do I think that we're likely to break out of this channel? Uh, I think it's too early to say. In fact, right now, I would be a bit nervous as we get a bit closer to right here at around 41.75, let's say give or take a little bit. Now that probably sounds familiar to you because we were saying that plus or minus range was a potential support level before the Jackson Hole meeting. So it, the, the, the point is, the reason why we focus on those horizontal levels is that investors do tend to get kind of anchored to that. And I think that that is still likely, which brings us to tomorrow, the CPI report, which is what everybody's been asking. Do we think it's gonna affect the market? Um, probably. So right now, uh, expectations are that CPI will come in pretty negative. In fact, let me just pull the most recent uh, estimate here. Let's see. I'm going to take a look at this real quick. So the most recent estimate or the most recent consensus estimate right now for CPI would be negative 0.1%. Uh, and core CPI, so if we exclude energy and food prices, so that's what that looks at. That would be 0.3%, which is still a little high. But if we pull out the old uh, calculator here, so let's see what that means in annualized terms. Okay, let's see here. So 1.003, and we'll raise that to the 12th power. That gives us an expected annualized inflation rate of 3.7%, which is a lot lower than what we were dealing with earlier this year. Is that temporary? Yeah, inflation is gonna go back up again. But if investors got something in that range, uh, maybe a little higher, but right about there, there, it's still high. And I think that that would coincide, that puts us at a, at a fairly high probability that we wind up with uh, the market at least pausing in the short term uh, at the this resistance level. So uh, is the channel still intact? I do think so. I would look at, 
accumulating towards these highs, meaning taking on a lot more risk in the portfolio towards these highs around 41.75 is a little high risk. I, I, I think I would either wait for the breakout or I would look for another bounce. So accumulate on another bounce. Because right now, even if we did see an excursion into the 4200 range on the S&P 500, I, I would expect investors are gonna be fairly motivated to take some short-term profits off the table. There's still a lot of uncertainty out there. We have the Empire Manufacturing Report coming out on Thursday. So not just the Fed this week, but also the Empire Report on Thursday. They, there's still a lot of volatility producers. This is almost like perfect timing that if we get something Better than expected tomorrow, we might get right to resistance. We pop up a little bit and it would be the perfect position for investors to take profits off the table after the Fed and the, the Empire report. So we, we, we got to watch for those pretty closely. So I don't want to come off as too wishy-washy in this case. What I'm basically saying is I think support, there's a lot of evidence that support is still very strong intact. I'd be a buyer at support. It's around 3,900 on the S&P. If I were looking to control my risk, I would avoid accumulating at resistance levels. Right now, I would put that at 41.75. I don't know that I'd be a seller, but I would avoid accumulating at those levels. I think that's a great opportunity, however. Those are good technical levels to be, let's say, a premium seller. So selling covered calls on stock positions that you're holding for the long run or against ETFs. Maybe adding some positions if, they're, if they've got a lot of uh, momentum, but I, I would want to see it in order to be more confident about it. And the, the, so it's more a matter of not thinking about the market in terms of real binary, bullish or, or bearish, but rather if we are in neutral territory, then where am I taking action and where am I not? Or what kind of action am I taking at these individual price levels? Okay, so with that, well, of course, we'll by the end of this week, when we're back, we'll have a lot more news to talk about, both the Empire Report, the Fed, the Inflation Report, and so forth. Uh, but for now, let's go to your questions. So let's see here. Uh, the first question that I've got is from Raman. So what does the word tape mean with respect to the uh, financial markets? I was looking at the CBOE market statistics for US equities, and then they have this table, which he's shown me the table from the CBOE. Okay, so the tape means, so if you've ever seen really old movies, or you've ever heard the phrase, a ticker tape parade, so that's what that is. So prior to, to computers being able to do all this stuff that we do now, uh, you, you had a device that basically sent you stock quotes and it printed out on this tape. So you, you would take the tape out and you'd read what's going on with the stock quotes. So if you've ever seen this motion in movies, or you know old movies, of course, prior to computers, uh, being able to do this kind of thing. That's so when they're talking about tape, that's what they're that's what we're saying. Now the NYSE has different kinds of tapes. They have tape A, tape B, tape C. I mean, these days it doesn't really. They they do report them individually, but it, it doesn't make any difference to traders really. Tape A are stocks that are listed on the NYSE. Tape B are stocks that are listed on the Nasdaq and listed on the NYSE, uh, or traded on the NYSE. And tape C is, um, these are stocks that, uh, sometimes they call them the regionals, and they're stocks that used to be listed on the American Stock Exchange. So it's a lot of basic materials companies, uh, oil companies, things like that. Uh, they, should you track all three tapes individually? No, uh, I mean, it doesn't really make a difference these days anyway. Plus, uh, the, the, to add to the confusion, so much of our market volume happens off the tape that we have visibility into. We don't find out about it until later because uh, there's nothing prohibiting big traders from being able to do stock transactions with each other. You probably always wondered, why don't stocks go totally bananas when they get added to an index? Sometimes you get a little bit of volatility there, but it's because the big traders who have to add the stock to their portfolio when it gets added to the Russell or added to the Dow or something like that, they do these deals off exchange. So, you know, they, there's a lot of volume these days that we just don't have a ton of visibility into. And that's frustrating, but that's, that's what it is. So, so whenever you hear the word tape, it's just kind of slang for quotes. All right, let's see here. Um, got a few more questions on thoughts on CPI. I think I answered that, Stephen, for you. I hope so. Um, can you look at Dix for possible cup and handle? Sure. Let's take a look at uh, Dix Sporting Goods. Let me just clean up my chart here a little bit. Uh, DKS. Let's see. Uh, DK, DKS. And, you know, retail right now uh, looks promising, looks very interesting. So possible cup and handle. Uh, okay, so ideally, you know, a cup and handle is an interesting pattern. It, it is, has a kind of a reputation of being a little bit subjective. 
Uh, but the couple and handle pattern is one where you get a positive bullish trend, then a long-term basing pattern, a little tail on the end here, and then you get a breakout. So it looks kind of like a coffee cup if you were to, to brew some coffee in there. So um, is this a cup and handle pattern? I would say no, because, I mean, well, not right now. I mean, you can make an argument that this is your basing pattern, but it's got to come all the way back up to where it was before, before you'd really count that. So I would say probably not, but this is kind of interesting. This is, uh, I would say, it has a lot of the indicators of a nice inverted head and shoulders pattern, which has a good track record in the market. You know, right now, retail is looking better than expected. So a breakout like this, I mean, that's kind of compelling. I, I got to say, that looks pretty bullish. So cup and handle, no. Bullish, yes. Uh, from a technical perspective, this looks this looks interesting. So I'd, I'd wonder, I'd probably want to look at their uh, earnings report that they, that they released last uh, month before getting too serious about them. But I think that there might have been a little bit of pent up demand because that was overlapping with all the other Fed nonsense at the time. Uh, but yeah, we, we'd be looking at that, that breakout point, which right now is around, what, 114 as uh, that layer of support. So yeah, pretty, pretty darn interesting. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, John and Wade, do you think from Kevin, do you think the chances of XLF, XLF is an ETF, XLF is an ETF that tracks uh, the financial sector, very heavily weighted towards the banks, as you might imagine, insurance companies and the like. Uh, let's see, the question is, uh, what do you think the chances of XLF's potential inverted head and shoulders playing out? I would say very high. Uh, several of my holdings, Bank of America, look like XLF, and some have no right shoulder unless you have an upsloping neckline. Right, 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 right. Like Schwab and Zions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, so uh, so to, to your questions, this is a good one. I just got done talking about the inverted head and shoulders pattern on Dix. And, and right now, th there's a ton of these that are forming. It's not uncommon for the market to get really highly correlated at major transition points. So if we are at one, if earnings this quarter wind up being a lot better than what we are expecting right now, we won't really know until much later this month as to what to more or less to expect. But if they do start to look a lot better, we could be in good shape. Now, if I'm right about the channel on the S&P 500, meaning the S&P 500, I think the upside right now is probably capped in the short term anyway. So that means the S&P is likely to pull back here in the short term, or even just plateau in the short term. I would expect financials to do the same thing. So would I be expecting the XLF to break out, let's say this week? No. Um, but do I think that the pattern is likely to be invalidated? I don't think that either. I just think it's early. I would be surprised if it broke the neckline here in the short term, but meaning the next few days. But by the end of the month, could we be looking at a breakout on both the S&P 500 as well as financials? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, th I think uh, there's uh, the housing market's been getting weaker and that's gonna drag on financials. I don't know if financials would be my top pick, but uh, I think that they would follow the market. So I, I don't know that they'll be outperformers, but you know, some select uh, ones could be interesting. You mentioned Schwab. I think brokers could be very interesting in over the next uh, couple of months. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> Can you do a technical analysis from Sam on Tesla? Sure. Um, so we've got, hmm. I mean, nothing's jumping out at me is particularly interesting. Uh, no real compelling classic patterns or anything like that. But, uh, you know, on Tesla, we are kind of flirting with a breakout point at around 304. I'd look for that. You know, Tesla is going to be benefiting from a, the dollar starts to ease back a little bit. That should be good for them. If, uh, you know, like, like a lot of tech companies, I would, I, 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 I gotta say, I think Tesla is gonna basically follow the S&P 500. And largely I say that because Tesla is gonna have a big influence on the S&P 500. And right now where they're coming up to 304 again, they've failed at this level twice already in the last month and a half. Uh, I'd say this pretty strong resistance here. 
I don't know. I wouldn't recommend anybody short Tesla. The whether you like them or not. I mean, I know fundamentally they're squishy, but the I wouldn't short them, but I wouldn't be accumulating at prior resistance. And, and that's basically where we are right now. Otherwise, do I see anything here that's very interesting? Um, not really. I mean, we do have this little broadening pattern here. You'll notice how it's been kind of oscillating within a widening range. This is called a right angle broadening pattern. You know, the long term historical data on broadening patterns is not super great. It's not bad, but it's not it's not great. So meaning that uh, not that it leads to bearish results, but that it's not extremely predictive for bullish results. So right now, that's the best thing that I've got on them from a technical perspective. You know, it looks OK. I think just that resistance is a really high risk position to be adding to a portfolio. I could see investors maybe covering here or maybe even short term traders taking some profits off the table, something like that. I think that's I think that's uh, far more likely right now. Is there a similar tool to the FedWatch tool? OK, so looking at the FedWatch tool, is there a similar tool to the FedWatch tool from the Chicago Merck for ECB target rate probabilities? Um, Eugene, I think that there if there's not something like this, no. But is there, well, you caught me a little flat footed. I think that there's something similar, but you know what, I'm just drawing a complete blank. It's not as easy to use as this. So if you're if you're just a retail trader going in, you don't have access to institutional data feeds, I don't think so. But I think uh, there are some indexes that are published to professional subscribers that replicate the same idea. There's no reason why you couldn't have that because they, they have similar futures uh, of uh, prices available. That's what this is calculated off as bond futures prices. Um, you know, I might have to circle back around on that, but I don't think that there's something that's just generally available to investors like the FedWatch tool. That's a good question. Well, let's see here. Uh, Young Money says, uh, commentators in the news media always mention a rising dollar is not good for tech, true, but almost never talk about the positive effects of a rising dollar. That's true. It's good for retail. It's good for retail. Now another good piece of information to compare when the dollar's moving. Okay, good, good, I'm glad. Uh, you also provide another contrary view from TV analysts that foreign investors shy away from US investments when the dollar is going up because it costs more. Yeah, it takes a while. Eventually they do. Yeah, eventually they do, but it takes a while. It, it's, one of these, it's one of these curves that slowly it kind of peters out and then starts working against you. So it's kind of true that eventually it does cause a problem, but not, not in the short term. Uh, I dabble in currency tradings and I trade with travel abroad. Oh, good. All right. Uh, so I get what you mean when you say a foreign investor gets a little gravy when they convert the dollar back into home currency. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad that was helpful. The, the, the point there, what, what, what he's referring to is the fact that, um, that yes, a, a stronger dollar is problematic for tech companies, but it's not so bad for uh, retail. So especially consumer staples. So if you think about like Dollar General and Target and Walmart, Costco and uh, what do we do? Uh, Kroger's even that that winds up benefiting them in the short, and it, it reduces inflationary pressure because imports are cheaper in stronger dollar terms. So right now, if you're trying to figure out why is inflation tomorrow expected to be so low, like it was last month? Well, energy prices have been soft. That's number one. Uh, rents have been coming down. Number two. So those are your two big inputs. Actually, rents first, energy's next, and then on top of that, import prices have been coming down. So now these are not necessarily permanent, unfortunately, but they it temporarily, at least, they are easing back on that inflationary pressure. So that, that's one of the reasons why. And that, that benefits uh, retailers, like as I mentioned with Walmart, Target, Costco. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think, uh, actually, I think that's the end of the questions. I think I caught them. All right. OK, so let's wrap up here. We'll be back again, of course, after all the major news is out with a updated outlook for the S&P 500. And as usual, if you like the kind of content that we're producing, the ability to get questions answered, please let us know in the comments. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Uh, suggestions for future topics is always really helpful. And we do read them all. They are extremely useful for us. So keep them coming. Thanks, everybody.